That rare color footage is from early July of 1941. We're back for the third time embedded with the 20th Panzer Division in a recon unit as the division advances on Minsk and so creates the Bielestock Minsk Pocket. Finally relieved from guard duty, the division races east in preparation of taking part in an operation to cross the Divina River at Ulla. At the end of the video, as we watch 1940 color footage of German armored car crews training, I'll introduce a new video on demand platform that is being developed and explain why. If you like this kind of combination of primary source material, please like the video and subscribe to the channel. There really is no channel on YouTube that does this better. This is a situational map for June 29th, 1941, the day the 20th Panzer Division, advancing south, closed the lid on the Soviet pocket, situated to the west of Minsk, which was comprised of four Soviet armies. The wearing down of this pocket would last until July 9th and cost the Soviets 420,000 soldiers and was the end of the Soviet Western Army. Many believed that this represented the end of the Soviet ability to resist and the approaching end of the war. If you'd like to see more detail related to the build-up and to the closing of this enormous pocket, take a look at part two of the 7th Panzer Division series. Minsk was the first large Soviet city that the 20th Panzer Division saw. Here's the impression a grenadier from the division had. At first, Minsk seemed like a town. The small wooden houses in the northern suburbs with their fences and gardens in badly need of repair remind me of Polish and Belarus villages. As we roll into the center of Minsk, we suddenly see large representative buildings which were intended to impress. A few days earlier, the Luftwaffe must have bombed extensively because there are ruins everywhere. The civilians swarm the streets, looting the city administration buildings, looking for anything at all that is of value, especially food and clothing. In addition, bodies of Red Army soldiers are lying around and nobody takes notice. For the next couple of days, the 20th was assigned to guard duty to make sure, as per Führerbefehl, or direct order from the Führer, that no Soviet troops would be allowed to break out of the pocket. The unit had a chance to refit and actually relax as they prepared for their next push to the east. The footage from this period puts into context the varied pace of a frontline soldier's experiences. It also reminds me of the descriptions made by a young 22-year-old German soldier in his 1942 diary written while serving on the Eastern Front. For example, he wrote, How beautiful Russia is, standing in knee-high grass fields overflowing with wild flowers. An endless view over an open and hilly landscape is breathtaking. High above the fields of corn, larks sing. Nearby crows a rooster that has somehow avoided ending up in someone's frying pan. Our tranquil hike continues on for hours without passing through a village or even seeing a single simple hut. Then around midday, again, all hell breaks loose around us. He writes that his least favorite duty is to unload truckloads of birch branches. They are used for grave markers, and he explains that large deliveries always arrive to the front line whenever a new offensive is about to kick off. Early on the morning of July 2nd, reinforcements arrived to the 20th Panzer Division, which included the important 51st Nebelwerfer Regiment. Make sure to see the videos we have on that formation the private film footage is really special. In this map you can see a massive minefield has been positioned to hinder any attempt by the trapped Soviet troops to escape to the northeast. At this point, Stalin had the leaders of the troops trapped in the pocket flown to Moscow. 
Upon arrival, they were all shot. At 600 hours, the 12th Panzer Division arrived, which freed up the 20th to immediately again begin moving east. As the 20th pulled out, the wearing down of the Bielestock Minsk pocket was well underway. This responsibility was given mainly to the infantry divisions that were working in close cooperation with artillery units and squadrons of Luftwaffe bombers. Whenever possible, the panzer divisions and mechanized infantry were freed up to continue advancing. Before we leave Minsk, I'd like to mention an event that took place a few months later that would have lasting consequences on the war. In September, the 17-year-old girl, Masha Brushkina, who was a volunteer nurse taking care of wounded Soviet soldiers, was caught helping them escape by providing civilian clothing and false papers. The occupation authorities decided to make an example of her, and she was hung publicly and didn't allow for her body to be cut down for three days. This is a picture of her being paraded through the streets before her execution, carrying a sign that reads, Wir sind Partisanen und haben auf deutsche Soldaten geschossen, which actually wasn't true. It was a brutal incident that certainly accelerated the growth of partisan activity. Once this spiral of violence had begun, there was no stopping it. Yes, it was a war filled with stark contradiction. The race to the east was on with the intention of arriving to and crossing the Divina River at Ula as quickly as possible to stop the Soviets from preparing effective defensive positions on the far bank. The two panzer divisions, the 7th and the 20th, pushed forward through the heat and dust all day and by 1445 hours arrived to the city of La Pelle. Here, because of a blown bridge, a lack of good roads, and the generally chaotic advance, a terrible traffic jam developed and brought the column to a stop. Engineers frantically jumped to work repairing the bridge. Precious hours were being lost. The following morning, in a stroke of luck, an undamaged bridge leading out of the city to the northeast was found, and, just as importantly, an undamaged Soviet fuel dump containing 50,000 liters is discovered. The vehicles were able to fill their tanks and the frantic advance continued towards Ula. This private footage from 1940 shows armored car crews training. So far, the experience of posting videos has been a bit of a mixed bag. Subscribers have asked to see more combat footage, which is often deemed inappropriate and leads to having videos flagged or even blocked, which severely limits monetization. Another cause for limitations is the abuse of copyright protection. For example, the use of original World War II era tone recordings of marching band music is all too often flagged as being copyright protected. Using authentic music has simply become too risky. A video can be flagged for these reasons immediately upon publication or sometimes months after publishing. You're usually given the option to have the flagged section clipped out, which of course leaves holes in the videos. I apologize for these holes. Depending on how the politics of history and the abuse of copyright law develop, I can even imagine that the channel could be actually shut down. In response, planning has begun for the creation of a fully independent and locally hosted video on demand platform. Please let me know in the comments section if you would support such a project. Also, if you'd like to keep up to date on the platform's development, you can subscribe to the newsletter by clicking on the link posted at the top of the description of this video. Thanks for watching.